Uh, I'm Matthew Horn. I'm a manager in uh, CF r and at Pivotal. And I'm Natalie Ariano. I'm an engineer in the Bosch Windows team. So uh, just a, a quick overview of you know, why we thought Windows on Cloud Foundry should be a thing. Uh, with Spring and Java and that world, uh, we had a lot of validation of a uh, positive experience with developers uh, doing the CF push experience. And we knew that there was a large market out there that was using .NET. And there's a huge opportunity for us to engage with uh, you know, maybe 50% of developers who are on .NET that we were missing before in the enterprise space. And so uh, we, we wanted to, uh, as we embarked on Diego and our refactor of the container runtime for Cloud Foundry, we had an opportunity to also investigate uh, adding Windows support to the platform in a first-class way. We actually had uh, Windows support in a uh, sort of second-class way uh, with Iron Foundry, which was a fork of Cloud Foundry in the early days. Uh, and we wanted to make that first-class support. And so uh, we started that off with, uh, with an MVP. And uh, before spending too much time and in investing in the tooling for that, uh, we wanted to do a quick validation. Um, so today we are going to tell the story of the journey of our team um, from the early days of bringing up Windows cells um, with MSI installers, uh, the road that we traveled in porting the Bosch agent over to Windows, um, some choices that we made and some learnings from that journey, and uh, finally the benefits that we found in moving to Bosch. So the initial uh, MVP was this uh, MSI workflow that we came up with. So uh, MSIs are installers for Windows. They're just packages of bits that you can install on a system. Uh, Windows administrators are pretty familiar with MSIs. Bosch is totally not a thing they've heard of. And so as we're trying out an MVP, uh, that made a lot of sense for us to just say, here's an installer. Why don't you try, try that out and see if you like this Cloud Foundry thing. Uh, but that initial uh, MVP, sort of had these window cells kind of off uh, in their own on the side. And you had your nicely Bosch deployed Linux VMs all managed with Bosch. Uh, if you used uh, Pivotal's uh, Cloud Foundry, you had the uh, ERT deploying all that for you. And then you had to manage this thing outside of that. But uh, the great thing is the developer experience was CF push with a dash S flag for stack. And you could say, I want this to run on Windows. So we really wanted to do that early validation for the developer to make sure that this made sense. You know, we, we realized that uh, the operator experience is lacking here, uh, but let's validate that developers even want the CF push experience before we spend too much time developing a platform. Uh, our operators were forced to manually spin up VMs. This is a relatively heavyweight process at some of our customer sites. Uh, sometimes it can take like six, month, six months plus to get a VM. And then you have to go get the validation to install these MSIs on there. Uh, but we already had all these components, the Diego Rep, Console, Metron. Uh, those are all written in Go. They were easily uh, ported to Windows. And uh, all we had to do was get that running uh, on Windows cells. We also had to write the garden server for Windows. That was fun, but that's a different talk. So um, going into a little bit more detail on how we get the VMs up and running. Um, on AWS, you could specify a cloud formation template and provide properties like the subnet that you're working in, the security groups that should be applied. Um, this is something, this automation was not available on um, other IaaS's like vSphere. Um, we also uh, needed a way to get the right uh, configuration on the VMs, so we needed to install uh, Windows features, configure DNS settings, um, etc. And this is again something that um, was automated a little bit on AWS, but um, was another sort of manual um, possible point of failure. Um, I think that's it. Okay. 
so let's look at uh, what is actually running on the cells. Um, we have garden windows, which is the containerization technology. Uh, this was written and maintained by the greenhouse team. Um, we also have Diego Windows, which is comprised of the three jobs, console, rep, and Metron. Um, this was not written or maintained by our team. Uh, and so we didn't have a lot of visibility in um, what could be going on uh, with those jobs and how they might be changing. And uh, finally, we have Hakim, which is um, not necessary for the cell to function in Diego, but something that we wrote to help with troubleshooting and more easily pinpointing customer issues. Um, so we needed to be able to start all those jobs with the right configuration so that they could work with the rest of Cloud Foundry. Uh, so we needed to pass a bunch of parameters to the MSI installers. And um, you know, example would be something like SSL certificate for the rep to communicate with BBS. Um, so in order to figure out what these values should be, we needed a way to reach out to the Bosch director and grab those values and pass them to the MSI. This is uh, what our install script generator was for. Um, this is something that uh, turned into a little bit of a pain point for our team to maintain because you know, as more and more of these properties got added, uh, you know, it, it got more and more complicated. And um, this is also something where, you know, because we didn't write uh, the Diego jobs, um, we were often pay play playing catch up to, uh, to fix things when, when uh, there were new additions or changes. Um, Another thing that we encountered is uh, that you know, our Windows operators already sort of have a, a preferred method for maintaining configuration on their servers. So um, typically this involves uh, you know, domain joining the servers together and uh, maybe applying some group policies. Uh, this, this is another possible point of failure because those policies could interfere with some of the settings that we needed uh, for you know, our technology to function uh, properly. Uh, so an example might be um, enabling interactive uh, logon for IIS I users. Um, so we, we sort of discourage this practice and uh, you know, we consider that domain join is uh, uh, inconsistent with 12-factor principles. So we consider that an anti-pattern for CF. Right, so uh, lots of limitations there with, with that approach. The manual steps uh, led to lots of problems. Uh, if Bosch properties were changed in a manifest uh, when you were doing a Bosch deployment, inevitably uh, you either forgot to rerun the install script generator and then roll your cell, or you know, something broke during that deployment process. And our Linux operators are so used to this seamless canary deployment and uh, rolling upgrade process that they weren't getting with Windows that we're hearing, okay, everything's working great for the CF developer, but the Windows operator experience is terrible. And so we were getting that feedback and we heard it loud and clear. Uh, one of the really challenges uh, with the rolling upgrades is you basically had to set up a brand new cell, which remember, if that takes you six months to get a VM, uh, somehow this math isn't gonna work for like upgrading your Cloud Foundry. Uh, then you have to drain an old cell, wait for the new one to get those applications, and then what do you do with the old VM? Do you try to upgrade it or destroy it? And inevitably it was uh, complicated and fragile, right? So the group policies are always a, a huge problem, uh, but operators love group policies because they could do things like distribute uh, CA certificates to all their servers really easily from a central place, right? So we heard that, uh, but we knew that this was a thing that Bosch might be able to solve for us. Uh, another challenge was uh, this host names uh, of your servers must be unique. So one thing that operators of uh, Windows servers and particularly with like vSphere or OpenStack would do is set up one template VM, clone it, and then just start it up again. Oftentimes that just mean that the VM had the same host name over and over again, which meant with console, just register the same VM name over and over again. And so you'd actually have one cell, uh, even though you had like 10. That really didn't work too well. 
but these manual processes just led to problems over and over again. Uh, oftentimes, people wouldn't run set up PS1, which would set up uh, the default firewall rules, and then application security groups wouldn't work. So all things that we can automate with Bosch. And so uh, one of my favorite tweets from uh, a couple of years ago is this picture of a presentation talking about how uh, no, no CEO is ever proud of you for configuring servers. And uh, maybe you notice in the background, this is uh, Mordor. So the outcome of this process were that operators were understandably underwhelmed, um, but developers were really happy. Uh, so we, this was the validation of the MVP that we were looking for before investing in Bosch Windows. Great. Uh, so our mission here was to uh, deploy Windows cells just like the rest of uh, Cloud Foundry. We didn't want these snowflake uh, cells that inevitably ended up being deployed. Uh, so. Great, you got that Windows server, it worked really well. Copy it, uh, change a little thing about it. Uh, no, it's terrible, really, really bad idea. And we wanted everything to be easy to rebuild and, uh, and automatable. And this is a thing that Bosch just does for you. Ultimately, uh, we just wanted to distribute the releases and give you a manifest, a couple of stem cells, and uh, there'd be no more manual deployment. Okay. Um. So we needed a stem cell running the Bosch agent. Um, so let's look at the work that was involved to make the agent work on Windows. Um, the agent is written in Go, which is great because we can compile it for Linux or Windows. Um, we compile all of the code for um, each OS, but we invoke different um, code paths depending on which OS we're running on. Um, so there is uh, a lot of shared functionality between Linux and Windows in the agent, but some things needed to be implemented differently on Windows. Um, so the work of our team was to go through and figure out what needed to be implemented differently on Windows and um, to do that one function at a time, uh, starting with the, the platform interface. Um, so, and, and part of our work in testing this was to uh, reverse engineer the director protocol. So write essentially a fake director to send commands to our agent and then make assertions on the messages being passed back and forth. Uh, so this uh, is an illustration of um, one of the major differences between um, Windows and Linux in the agent. Um, on Linux, we use Monit to start and stop processes, uh, but on Windows, we decided to use the Windows Service Wrapper, or WinSW, which is a third-party library uh, that allows us to start our processes as Windows services uh, using the Windows Service API. Uh, and so this means that our Monit file looks different from you might uh, be used to on Linux, uh, on the left is Linux, on the right is Windows. Um, so on Windows, it's just a JSON file and you can, um, you know, you specify the process to run, any arguments, uh, environment variables, and this gets all uh, packaged up as an XML file that we send to WinSW. Uh, so what else is different? Um, so our, our implementation uh, in WinSW means that it's not easy for us to send uh, a control C uh, to our running process. So we, we just SIG kill everything. And uh, this means that any cleanup that would be required to um, halt your process gracefully should be done in a drain script uh, because right now stop scripts aren't supported. Um, we we encountered some, um, some difficulties in uh, tailing the log files on Windows. So this means that each individual job is actually responsible for forwarding its uh, logs to a syslog endpoint. That means that in your release, you have to specify that endpoint uh, separately for each job. And uh, finally, our packaging script is a PowerShell script, which is uh, significant because that won't work on a Linux uh, machine. And uh, in compiling releases, we don't have a way to specify which OS uh, should run the packaging step. So we needed a way to skip this uh, on, uh, on Linux. And um, the way that we did it was this uh, sort of uh, 
complicated, or not complicated, but a little bit of uh, uh, wizardry here with um, sourcing the uh, script called exeter.ps1 at the top of each uh, packaging script. And um, this leverages some different functionality between Windows and Linux. Um, on Linux, uh, I should say first that exeter.ps1 is just one line of code, just exit zero. And on Linux, this actually calls the calling script to exit as well. Um, but on Windows, it is spun up in a subprocess and the subprocess dies, but the uh, rest of the script continues to execute. So this accomplishes the differential behavior that we were looking for. It's still a bit of an MVP, right? <laughs> Uh, so Windows Boss jobs are, uh, we, we basically decided, okay, well, we've, we had the uh, MSIs from before, so let's figure out how to get rid of those, right? And so uh, the jobs that we have are uh, rep windows, console agent windows, Metron agent windows, you know, there's a pattern here, underscore windows. Uh, so in order to upstream these in, into other releases and due to the differences in both the packaging .ps1 and uh, the actual monet file specification, we had to namespace everything. And so uh, this has been a little bit of a point of contention for release authors because it leads to a little bit of duplication. We're definitely open to feedback uh, on this interface and we want to make it better. Uh, but ultimately the goal was we didn't want to, as the Windows team, be maintaining other people's uh, component releases anymore. And so this allowed us to upstream everything to the responsible teams. Uh, the great thing is we already did the hard work of figuring out how to cross compile every other team's component for Windows. So we just gave them all that code, which is great. Uh, we also had Bosch now and you know, everyone's afraid of Windows, but no more excuses. We can just say, here's a concourse worker release. Uh, you like concourse, so just run that. And uh, that's, that's been an awesome uh, point forward for, for our team and collaborating with everyone else on Windows. The only thing that is maintained by a Windows specific team, uh, except for the Bosch agent itself now, is uh, Garden Windows. And uh, this particular component is only uh, responsible for containerization. So the, uh, the operator experience now is uh, there's a CF deployment ops file. So if you want a Windows cell, you just opt into that behavior. You have to uh, upload the Windows stem cell as well. There's still no domain join. Uh, we're still figuring out our story there, uh, but we'll have more on that soon. Uh, but you can finally focus on deploying applications as an operator and, and enabling that within your organization instead of managing servers, which is the whole CF story. There's even an antivirus add-on. Funny story, uh, one of our customers really wanted uh, antivirus for their Node.js app. And so they stood up Windows servers with an antivirus add-on to run Node.js. It works. Uh, so for, uh, for stem cells, uh, we build stem cells and publish stem cells for public IaaS's. So if you're using uh, Azure, GCP, or uh, AWS, you can pull down uh, a stem cell for that IaaS. Uh, for on-prem, for OpenStack, or for vSphere, uh, the process is currently a bit more complicated, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Uh, basically due to licensing constraints. Distribution, redistribution, Windows, Microsoft, it's complicated. Uh, we realize that this is one of the most difficult things about our current uh, solution for Bosch deployed Windows, and we, we are actively working with Microsoft on making that better. Uh, great tweet from this morning. Uh, so we do have the Windows stem cells live on Bosch IO for all the public IaaS's. So if you'd like to check those out, you can go and grab those. These are light stem cells. We're not distributing Windows. Uh, so tell all your friends uh, that they, they can't get a free copy of Windows from this. So we still have some limitations of um, the Bosch agent on Windows compared to Linux. We uh, don't currently support all of the features that are supported on Linux. Um, so that includes stop scripts, as I mentioned, uh, persistent disks, more than one ephemeral disk, and Bosch SSH. Um, this is something that we're, we're working on. Um, and also, 
as I mentioned, we don't uh, currently have uh, compiled releases for Windows. So what's next for our team? We're working on uh, implementing the missing features. Um, stop scripts uh, should be uh, ready very soon. Um, we're working on building a stem cell for window, Windows Server uh, 2016. Um, we're hoping to be able to share a, a strategy for a better on-prem stem cell experience. And uh, we're looking to forward uh, the Windows event log to our syslog endpoint. So that should make debugging easier. Great. So uh, if you'd like to get in touch, you can find us in the Bosch channel on the Cloud Foundry Slack. Uh, William Martin, who's in the second row here, and Colin Jackson, who's back in New York holding down the fort, are our PMs. And uh, you can also find us on the CF Dev mailing list. So please get in touch. Any questions? Zach? So why, is, why was Hakeem called Hakeem? Uh, why was Hakeem called Hakeem? Uh, there's, there's a story there. Uh, I don't remember the entire story. Uh, Hakeem means a thing in Arabic, and we liked what it meant. And uh, basically, we wanted the thing that checks this, the health of your Windows installation. And so that was a good name. Uh, we wanted a good name that you could remember, and it was short, and you could type it easily. So uh, that's the story. Great, great question. So basically on, on uh, Server 2016, there's a, a subsystem for Linux and there's true bash uh, support. Will we investigate that? Uh, maybe, but we really like PowerShell. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Also, generally, Windows administrators are comfortable with Power, PowerShell more so than Bosch. So I guess we'll have to see who our target audience is for writing those scripts. and figure out what makes sense. There's no reason that it couldn't work, right? Uh, and we could support both, ultimately. Yeah, for release authors, that would be really helpful. Cool. Uh, yes, <laughs> we should talk. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate more on the challenges about compiled releases? Yeah, so the compiled release challenges, uh, you know, basically we, we uh, we wrote all this stuff, we put together the agent, we shipped it out and then we discovered uh, during an internal release process for uh, PCF release uh, that we were breaking the entire process for building uh, ERT. And so uh, our, our quick way around that was this source exeter.ps1 uh, because the folks building uh, that compiled release didn't have a way to specify or say skip the Windows, uh, the Windows jobs. So this is a thing that we should uh, definitely talk about making a, a proper solution for, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, is it also the plan to uh, enable uh, the Windows Plus manager and the other PCA tiles? For Ops Manager and other tiles? So we have support uh, in Ops Manager. So if you upload a Windows stem cell, uh, it'll be recognized. And the, uh, there's both the regular Linux uh, ERT and there's a Windows runtime tile that you can upload as well. So you upload both of those and that'll deploy Windows cells for you. So in addition to the open source, which we mentioned, uh, you can have the Pivotal deployed. For log, log aggregation. So Loggregator works uh, just out of the box. That's the Metron agent. So that's already running on Windows. Uh, Natalie mentioned the syslog and the log forwarder. And that's a, a thing that we're working on right now. Evan? 
heard like some fud around licensing there, but if, if you use those lights themselves, like the billing for licensing comes out of your ISO, right? Right. right. So that's all taken care of. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So you're not getting Windows for free. I'll, I'll make that clear again. Uh, we are not giving Windows away for free. Uh, if you use a public IaaS, you will get billed for that. Uh, so. Twenty sixteen stem cells. What? So we've built one. It works. But what do you want twenty sixteen for? Come and find me after. Great. I'll I'll talk a lot with you about that. That'd be. Yeah. So uh, we actually have been working with uh, with 2016 uh, quite extensively. Uh, the garden anchor and William are here in the second row. You can talk with them all about that, uh, or me. But it's boring to talk to me, and it's more interesting to talk to them. So. So you just need separate jobs, right? So you don't need a dedicated release. You can have, uh, so for instance, there's one CF release that has all the jobs in there. There's one Diego release that has all the jobs in there. Uh, but we use that little namespace of the underscore windows hack uh, to separate out the jobs. Anyone else? Yeah? When do you think you'll have a persistent store? William, well, yeah, when will we have persistent store? The earliest optimistic date could be end of August, maybe. Maybe end of August. Uh, it turns out uh, we, we actually did a spike, I think Natalie and I, on, uh, on persistence. And we discovered it's way more complicated than you'd think it is, uh, just based on things that the IaaS does with disks and the way that Bosch uh, presents disks to VMs. So we thought it was going to be really easy. Uh, we spent a total of eight hours on it and discovered that it wasn't, and then focused on other things. We'll probably have to do it one IaaS at a time as well. Yeah, there are also IaaS subtleties. Great. Well, you can find us after, ask any more questions, and uh, we'll be around.